Hey, Lake Point, Pastor Michael here to get you caught up on the second week of our series, How Not to Read the Bible. Now, have you ever thought about how some of the most important pieces of literature in the entire bar Bible are actually personal letters written 2,000 years ago by people we've never met, Paul, Peter, James, John, and so on, and intended for people we know absolutely nothing about, and in places most of us have never been, and in a culture we cannot fully grasp. As one of my Bible college professors said, reading the New Testament is like reading someone else's mail. You see, every time you crack the spine of a Bible, you are stepping into a strange and alien world. I'm talking 2,000 years at minimum of cultural, technological, philosophical, economical, ideological, social, political, moral, and linguistic differences. What we need to appreciate is that the Bible was written for us, but not to us. Now, what do I mean by that phrase, for us, but not to us? Well, the phrase for us is meant to echo the Apostle Paul's frequent reminder in the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians that the Hebrew scriptures and indirectly the New Testament writings are for us, that is, for our sake, for our instruction. And specifically, the us that Paul is referring to represents the church. Not specific, specifically for you as an individual, but it's for you as a member of Christ's church. And so, yeah, the Bible is for us collectively as followers of Jesus. This amazing and beautiful collection of literature is for your benefit. However, it's not written to us. It's not written to you. There was an original audience, which means when we engage with the scriptures, which we should do, we need to remain cognizant of the fact that all these pieces of literature are culturally embedded in a culture much different than our own in a world that is foreign to the one we know and operate in. Dr. Peter Enns, a professor of biblical studies at Eastern University, expands on this by saying, I don't think the value of these letters lies in our ability to ignore their time and place and make believe that they were written with us in mind every bit as much as the ancient Jews or Roman citizens they were originally written to. We get something out of them only by wrestling with the historical particularity and then doing the hard work of accepting the sacred responsibility of discerning how all of that works out here and now in whatever situation we find ourselves. I love how he puts that. We have a sacred responsibility to put in the hard work and discern how these ancient texts apply and manifest in our modern lives. If we think of the Bible as a personal letter from God to us, then that's how we're going to read it. And when we read it in that way, we risk misusing, misapplying, and misunderstanding what's been communicated. The authors of the Bible were not thinking of you when they penned their various letters or historical accounts or laws or prophecies or poems. Their words weren't written to a person living in Leamington, Ontario in the year 2024. And so if you and I hope to know what a Bible passage has to say, then we need to begin by knowing what these inspired documents were communicating to their original audience. If we want to apply the Bible as accurately as possible to our context, it begins with knowing what it meant in their context. It begins by considering the history, the culture, the language, the unspoken beliefs and worldviews of that day. Which means, whether you like it or not, biblical study requires historical study. God has disclosed himself to us in scripture through particular people, through particular language, and in particular space-time history. It, it, it is a historical revelation. Every chapter in the Bible has so much more going on beneath the surface. So in light of that, here's three th recommendations for you. First, be teachable. This is about the attitude and position of your heart as you read the Bible and interact with other Christians. Be teachable, be open to having your presuppositions challenged, be willing to abandon old assumptions in light of new revelation. Remind yourself that every time you read the Bible that you're entering a foreign world and everything may not be as straightforward as you're perceiving it. Be mindful that the authors and the original recipients, they, they had different underlying views on race and ethnicity. They didn't view the world through a scientific and individualistic lens like you do. They, they lived in an honor and shame culture rather than a culture of right and wrong. They had different perceptions of time. They had different unspoken rules. They handled relationships differently and they even had different virtues and vices. And so be teachable. There really is a, a lot to learn. In fact, I think that one of the most beautiful things about the Christian journey is that there's always more to learn. There are always more ways to grow. There's always more insight to stretch and challenge you. In rabbinic tradition, they talk about treating the scriptures as if they were a gem, like a diamond. When, when you read it, you keep turning it and you let the light refract through the various faces in new and unexpected ways. The rabbis would encourage their students to keep turning the gem and to see something new each time. I invite you to do the same. 
My second recommendation is that you would gather insight. And what I mean by that is don't just read the Bible, read books about the Bible, watch videos about the Bible, listen to podcasts about the Bible, purchase yourself a study Bible, find resources that can complement your Bible reading. Remember, the goal isn't information, it's formation. The Bible points us to Jesus, and ideally, it helps us live more like Jesus. Finally, my last recommendation, read together. If you read the Bible alone, Bible alone, that's great, that's awesome. But if that's all you do, you're missing out. You should be reading the Bible as part of a, a community, as part of a group of friends or family, as part of a life group or growth group or, or mentoring group. When you read with others, you will encounter people who have been reading the Bible longer than you have or have studied things you haven't or, or you know, just you'll be able to pick up a few things that you've learned about the, that they've learned that you haven't about the background and context. And what's interesting is that in Jesus' day, the Torah started the discussion. It really was the beginning of the conversation for them. For many in our world, though, the Bible ends the discussion, it ends the conversation. But in the first century world of Jesus, the Torah and the prophets and the wisdom writings were, were the star of the conversation, the star of the discussion. You read it together, and then you interpreted it together in community, and you engaged with it. And this wasn't just an intellectual exercise for the early church, this was about life. Like, how do you live? What do you do? How do you act? How do you treat people? How do you conduct yourself? When people come to Jesus and they ask him questions in the gospel accounts, most of the time they're asking him questions about the Torah and how it should be interpreted. Which is why almost every time he's asked a question, he responds with a question, well, how do you read it? Or how do you, what do you think it says? Or how do you interpret it? There's an implied dialogue that is meant to take place. And this practice continued on into the early church as the gospel accounts and letters of the apostles began to circulate amongst the Jesus followers and were added to the scrolls of the Torah. They heard them read, they read them together, and then they made decisions about how to actually live it out. And I believe we're meant to do the same. We're meant to read the Bible together and then make decisions about what it means to love our neighbors here in 2024. Make decisions about how to honor and respect life. Make decisions about how to exactly do we keep one day holy. Make decisions about how to best care for the poor and on and on. The Jews and the early followers of Jesus lived with the assumption that there was always something new to learn, always something new to discuss, always something new to talk about because life never stops bringing you events and circumstances that demand you ask the question, what is the wise thing to do here? And so friends, I think we need to get back to that. Every time you open your Bible, you're entering a different time in history. You're entering a, a different culture. And so be mindful of that. The Bible was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. So be teachable, gather insight, read it together. Although simple, those things can radically transform how you interact with the scriptures, and more importantly, radically impact how you live the scriptures out. And really, that's the goal, to move from interpretation to incarnation. In the Gospel of Matthew, a large crowd gathers and Jesus tells them that he hasn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. Abolishing and fulfilling were common ways of speaking about the Torah in Jesus' day. When people were discussing the Hebrew Scriptures and trying to figure out what it looks like to live it out, if someone suggested a terrible or a misguided interpretation, they would be told, you have abolished the Torah, or as we might say it, you've missed the point, or you are out in left field. But if you got it, and if there was some agreement that yes, this is what it means, that, that this is what it looks like to live it out, then what you would say is you have fulfilled the Torah, because that was the goal, to take the words and bring them to life in your life. That's the movement in the Bible from word to flesh. That's what we mean by the word incarnation. It's not ultimately about the words, it's about the powerful, mysterious thing that happens when the words are acted out in the real world by real people. And so when Jesus comes along and says that he's come to fulfill the Torah, he's announcing that he's come to make it speak, to show what it looks like in actual space and time, to put a body on it, to give it legs. And he calls us, his church, to wrestle through these things, to, to pick up our sacred responsibility and to do the same. Well, friends, thanks for listening. Enjoy jumping in discussion questions. I'll see you next time.